Hi, I'm Renee. We're here today with Tony Kerna, the library's genealogy coordinator. We'd like to welcome you all today and we'll just get started. You know, Tony, when it comes to genealogy, you have so many stories, but everyone has a story to tell. And I guess it all starts with a story. And as the library's genealogy coordinator, how um, does genealogy help you tell your story? Well, actually, Renee, they both work hand in hand. Um, the experience that I've seen when I'm trying to help people do their research, um, a lot of times in our digital world, that can be a drawback to helping a person do their research because they're so fast to want to start entering in surnames into those online search boxes. And that's all that they're going with is just a story, which is a good starting point. But one of the things that I basically suggest to all researchers, new and even researchers who've been doing it for a while, to go back with other relatives, other family members. If you still are lucky enough to have fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents alive, that's where it starts with doing genealogy. Um, it's when you interact with your, your direct older relatives, you ask them, what is it that you can tell me about how you grew up? Where did you grow up? Geography is one of the most important aspects to get from the beginning of a story from our relatives, because without having an anchor point, of geography, that becomes an impossibility to discover the records you need to start building the family trees. So yes, we're talking about the year 2020, but if you're lucky enough to find out from an ancestor, an elderly person who still might be 90 years old, and find out and discover that 90 years ago, he wasn't born in Illinois, he might have been born in some small town in southern Indiana or northern Wisconsin. And that's where you need to start capturing that kind of information that will help you with the stories of the ancestors that you're going to start putting together and coordinate that with the records you're going to discover on them. So I'm here with all of some of the program or many of the programs that you've done on the Veteran History Project in the background here that are available on our YouTube channel. Can you tell us a little bit about the Veteran History Project and your role in, in that, and then how the library helped make that happen? Sure, I, I guess I would say I sort of stumbled into it to start with. Um, our librarians who do genealogy across the, north, the northern region of Illinois, Northwest region, we often have quarterly meetings and we sort of share things with each other and how we're helping researchers and new resources that come about to help with that. And it was during one of those programs that I actually, and this was like maybe three, four years ago, I actually heard some of the librarians talk about doing veteran history interviews and stuff. And of course, at that point, it went right over my head. I wasn't familiar with it. Our library wasn't doing anything. And so I started digging a little bit deeper, talking to them a little bit more. What is this thing you're talking about and how do you do it? And it turned out they were doing some of these interviews. Um, and ultimately I started digging to the point where I, I connected with the Library of Congress. And that is the organization that was basically challenging the whole of the country as family members, as participants in any way, shape, and form to get a hold of those veterans, talk to them, capture their stories. Because especially when we were talking now World War II stories, my gosh, the veterans who still are surviving from World War II are all in their 90s, approaching 100. Um, and so the, the goal was is to, for me to understand the process. What is it that this is all about? And in order to do that, I started looking at a lot of both the audio files of the interviews of veterans, as well as the video files of the veterans that were existing on the Library of Congress website. 
And so as I started just looking at these videos and listening to the audios, some of the things struck me as like, wow, that wasn't as good as I was hoping it would be. And, and some of the things that were, were, I guess I was discovering were family who were doing these interviews as, as well intentioned as those interviews were, they didn't technically turn out as good as you would hope for the one time that you get to capture a story, you really want it to be good in terms of the setting, in terms of the quality of the video or the audio, uh, in terms of the questions that were being asked. And so this is what was leading me down the path to say, wow, I know that it's a good thing that families do this to capture these moments, but maybe we as a library, and especially our library, where we have an, an on-site TV studio, great cameras, great lighting, great microphones. And that's what sort of led me down the path that I thought, well, okay, if we're gonna do this as a library, let's do it good. So that was more sort of the impetus behind where I raised the question internally to our, our management team. Can we do this? And if we do it, can we do it here in our studio when we can? And so that was how it started. And they said yes. And I think that's really a good, um, I think that's wonderful that they said yes and allowed you to do this. And then the result is that you wear many hats, trying to find the veterans, learn their histories, practice, and then go out and uh, videotape it, uh, if you do, or do that in the studio. So you, you tell us about all the hats you're wearing. Yeah, I agree with that part. It, 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 again, I was sort of getting a little nervous that not only was it okay to do this, but now did I bite off more than I can chew in terms of how we can do it in the studio? So in order to get the ball rolling, I sort of needed, I guess, a veteran and a veteran who would be a guinea pig. So where do you think I went to get that? I went to my own family to knock on my brother-in-law's door and, uh, and ask him, would he like to be a participant in the Veterans History Project, I explained to him what it was and what would be involved and that we would do it and we would do it at our library's TV studio. So sure enough, we got to that stage, him and his wife came, we were able to go into the studio. And at the time that we did that first interview, Renee, it was a pretty big project because I had more than just myself interviewing my, my brother-in-law. There was a few people involved with the technicalities of it and recording of it. And, and it was all being done before I actually moved to doing this with a camcorder. So nonetheless, uh, we went through the motions of it. And I will say this, I, I, I was probably, I guarantee you, I was more nervous doing that interview than my brother-in-law was. He sort of relaxed me during the process because you're sort of like, you know, not knowing if you're doing it right, if there is a right or wrong, and if things are recording correctly. Anyhow, to get to the end, we recorded it. We have to do at least, according to the Library of Congress, it requires us to do a minimum of a 30 minute video. And that's whether it's an audio only file or a video recording. And as it turned out, I also used a lot of the suggested questions that the Library of Congress offers to interviewers to say, here's where you can ask the question. You know, where were you born? We start with non-military stuff. Where were you born? Where did you live? Where'd you go to school? Did you go into, the, into college? How did you get into the military? Were you drafted? Did you enlist? Why did you pick the branch of service or how did you get into it? So, so it's like there's a whole series of good things that you can ask. And as it turned out for the first interview of my brother-in-law, I was very well past the minimum of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something in that vicinity. So anyhow, so we had the recording. Um, and then again, in order to polish up the recording, to add more to the, to the value of 
who the veteran was, um, I was actually able to, again, work with my brother-in-law. Not that this was the intended first start, but that what we were going to do is that he was going to provide me with some photographs that he had of a service. He was a, a, a Vietnam veteran. He was in the Air Force. And he was stationed overseas in Vietnam at the time and stuff. So we, he was able to provide me with some good photographs related to his service in Vietnam and some home photographs and stuff like that. And what I have to do then is I take the raw video footage, bring it into a video editing process. And the one that I use is called Camtasia. Uh, have it on my laptop and it allows me to bring in the raw video and allows me to, during parts of the video as it's playing, I can have another layer of the process, which is technical terms for how some of this is done. And it's on one of those layers that I can bring in by fading in a photograph, talk about it, not necessarily that it was key to our conversation, but it's amazing how I found out that a lot of the photos that this that my brother-in-law gave me and other veterans have given me just ties in perfectly well to parts of our conversation that I can fade the picture in, be let it be in front of the in front of the veteran so that the audience who's watching it can see it. And it's just amazing. So then I could fade that out. And it's also documents. Uh, right. Some and veterans have given me documents too. Right. And you've come by and shared your enthusiasm for some of the documents that the veterans have given you about their service. And uh, I think that's just the way that um, it just, it, it radiated your excitement for the work that you do. And had you not been open and excited and everything, I don't think so many of these things would have come to fruition. Because I remember you stopping by saying, being all uh, very enthusiastic about the documents that you received from someone. And then you go back, you cut those in. And then we are happy to say that we went to one of the senior buildings in January. One of the last things we were able to do, I think, with, with networking on the Veteran History Project, where we went into a senior building, and I cannot tell you what a joy it was to see you networking with five, five veterans, all in a little group, and you were explaining the project to them, and then one of them was able to participate in the project, right? Oh, I think you wrapped that up in February, and then in March, of course, the library closed due to the pandemic. But um, so it was great that you were out in the community talking to veterans. And can you tell us a little bit about one of those interviews? Sure. I'd love to tell you that one because that was another groundbreaking moment for our library. Up until um, I interacted with some of these veterans at Friendship Village, all of our interviews, as was intended, were being done in our library's TV studio. But then obviously the realization came into bear that, well, a lot of the veterans I was interviewing were a little bit on the younger side, but even still in today's world, these are 70 year old veterans from the Vietnam, from the Vietnam era. I've had a Korean War veteran and the World War II veterans that I've been able to do. Uh, but I thought, you know, we need to change gears a little bit and have the possibility and the availability to do these interviews off site. So when Renee brought this up, I was happy to be able to go to Friendship Village, meet with the meet with some of those who are interested in doing this interview and also get the lay of the land of Friendship Village itself, because where would I do an interview? Um, I was able to scope out some of the various rooms, and I knew that these were rooms that the staff at Friendship Village would allow me to use. So we checked it out, looked for the lighting, looked for nuances that were there, and how to best think of how to use this as an interview room and stuff like that. So anyhow, so one of the veterans, um, he was very excited. I think <laughs> maybe I think I excited him more <laughs> about this than I anticipated, but he couldn't wait to tell his story. 
So the way that, again, that I do these interviews is um, I don't meet with a veteran for the first time to do the interview that moment. We do a pre-interview. And so I met, I went to Friendship Village again to meet with this veteran and we sat down in the room. And again, I was asking him his stories. Where did he come from? What was his background? How did he get into the military? Where was he serve, uh, serving his, his duty and stuff like that? And so, yeah, so that was very, very helpful. It also gives me the chance to have the veteran, if they're willing and want to, and have available, bring some of those photographs during the pre-interview, bring documents that they have. And so we can sit down in a more casual moment, inter talking to each other, where I can get a better gauge of, gee, that's a great picture. Oh man, that's a really super picture. Or that's an interesting document that he's got. And so already my mind is already thinking ahead that when we do this interview for real, and I know the veteran better, and I know what the veteran's pictures and background was and where he served, that also facilitates me with the questions that I ask. So, so we were already set. So the next phase was going to be the actual interview. Excellent. And then we should say that those interviews, again, are on our YouTube page at Schomburg library.tv and the senior community friendship village did run those uh interviews uh, that most recent interview on their closed circuit internal tv channel so well i'm glad to hear that i wasn't aware of that yeah it's wonderful how they uh embraced it and so forth so to switch topics a little bit here um i think that there's a lot of to do these days about all these DNA tests. So we talked about history that should be related with the veteran history, even if they don't think they have a story to tell. Everyone has a story to tell. Then with all this DNA testing, sometimes you can learn about stories that um, maybe people don't want to be told. And so what's been your experience with this explosion on the market of all these different DNA testing and how does it relate to genealogy? Well DNA sort of started gangbusters probably about five to eight years ago uh, and I think then everybody as a genealogical researcher was innocently thinking wow I'm just gonna swab my cheek or I'm gonna spit into this vial and I'm gonna send it to the testing company and I'm gonna sit back and all those family trees are just gonna start rolling into the, into the picture and, and, and everything like that. I think that was a little bit overhyped initially and to, to some extent it still is. Um, so as an example, I know I have personally myself also submitted my cheek swabbing for my own testing. And uh, you can do that to a various different amounts of different companies. There's Ancestry DNA, there's Family Tree DNA, there's My Heritage DNA, and the list of companies goes on and on and on. And five to eight years ago, it was a pretty big financial commitment because the testing costs back then were really hovering in the $200 range. And, you know, you swabbed your cheek and you, you sent it in and you sort of sat back and now waited. Okay, now give me my family cousins and all of that stuff. Because what you get as results is through, and it varies by company. And mine was done through Family Tree DNA. So I can share with the audience what was happening and how things were, were unfolding at that point. I was getting, I got my results. And, and literally, it, it's sort of a dichotomy of results. One is you want, as a genealogical researcher, to get hooked up with connections on who matches to you DNA-wise. And some people, on the other hand, were submitting their DNA, not as much for that. 
but they were submitting it with the idea that, oh, I want to figure out what my ethnicity is and what percent German I am or what percent Italian I am. Because again, they were told from the stories, they may not have done any research whatsoever, but they were told that, oh yeah, our family came from Padua, Italy, or my family came from this town in Poland or whatever. And so you'd say, well, okay, those are the stories. I'm sure the DNA is going to prove that out 100%. And lo and behold, sometimes, sometimes the story isn't what you expect. You don't often get as high of a marking in a certain ethnicity as you think, which means that you know, you've got a, a broader ethnicity connection and stuff that's out there. Um, mine turned out to be pretty much what I expected. So, so there, you know, but it can, not, it can happen many times. You don't quite get that. So for me, my ethnicity was, I believe it said like 100% uh, European, 98% um, Eastern European, and in that quantity was the, the category of being Polish and stuff. So that was me, but that's not everybody. And so anyhow, the, the testing was done. And, and one thing that, that researchers have to be a little bit aware of is a lot of this is a marketing thing. Okay, I mean, I'm not trying to say that the companies you test with, that they're just going to leave you alone. They're constantly going to bring to your attention new tests, different tests um, that you can take. And, and they're correct that all of these tests will enhance the, the ability for you to, to sort of figure out better where you're at, who you're connected to, so on and so forth. Um, so the first test that I wound up taking was what was called the family, uh, I forget the exact name, but it's an it's a autosomal test. That's the genetic term that they use. You can also do an mtDNA test, which is like the male line or an ftDNA test down the road and stuff. But these are all based on your first test. So it's not like you have to submit new swabs or new cheek swabs. So when I did my first test, yes, swab, send to the company, wait a couple of weeks until I could get the results. Once you have that in their system, any further tests, at least again with family tree DNA, all you have to do is say, I want another test done. And because they basically have the original amount of what you submitted to them, the next test or further tests are all based on your original swab contribution to them. So, you know, it's, it, it's you're going to be receiving messages from them to do other kind of testing and stuff like that. But one of the things that I, I really want to say is the key for me was, is I was able to get a list of people who are genetically equivalent to me in some fashion. And it's all different degrees of relationship. Um, and the, again, in the world of DNA, there's a thing called uh, the uh, uh, chromosome levels. The, um, how, how they measure your um, close connectivity to this person. The higher the number, the closer that you are to this person. Um, I was a little hesitant because I have been telling people all along, you have to be careful when you submit these testing things because you think you're going to get instant family trees, but you could also get lists of people who are connected to you in ways that you never anticipated. Um, most of the time, they identify for you that these are first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, but you could get, and I mean, I would want to tell the audience this, you could get results that tells you that, guess what, you have a half sibling out there that you never knew about you could potentially find that, guess what? Because of this high numerical value of this measurement that's used, guess what? Your father might not be your father. Um, I mean, that's happened, and that's what I caution people who've not done a DNA testing, that this is stuff they have to be thinking about. Now, what are the chances of it happening? Slim to none, but they're not zero. So that can happen and that can be a drawback because boy, your whole life can change on the spot. 
if you find out that guess what there's a half sibling out there who you never knew about or that there is a biological father that's out there that you never knew about so if something like that were to happen could you also see something populate from another side on a family tree and uncover things like that you know when you do look at your family tree you can see more about siblings that your relatives had that you were not even aware of when you look online i guess that's that's what i'm asking well one of the things that helps a lot and here's another drawback of the dna testing with people when they they think it's going to be this instantaneous family tree just by one swab that they're going to get access to here's what I, my experience has been of all the people that match to me, most of them are at a level of second to fourth cousin, which is a very, very distant relationship. So yes, I can contact them, they can contact me. We put our heads together and try to figure out where our research is, where these families interact. Sometimes what happens is the distance is so far in the past that I myself may not have done enough research deep on it in order to determine who exactly it is that's matched to me or vice versa, who's matched to them through me and stuff. So it, it can be helpful, but one of the things that I've also seen that is not a good thing is that in the testing process, as an example, I know from the research I've done and some of the cousins that I've interacted with that we have some good family trees. So lo and behold, when I did my DNA testing, I matched to a cousin who had done their testing through the same company. And she was a high numerical value to me. And so I knew that she was matched to me. But the good part was she had done some great research and I knew exactly where our paths crossed in our family trees. But for the most part, many, many researchers who do, who do their research and, and then do a DNA swab, they don't put their family trees online with the DNA testing company. So if I'm a match to somebody and their tree isn't up there, I can't even begin to figure out where we're connected. So there's a hesitancy to put trees up, but if you don't put trees up, you, it's hard to figure out where you're connected and so on and so forth. So speaking of family trees, has anything changed during the pandemic? I know that, can you, there are a lot of resources available in our e-library, but are there any changes in these databases due to the pandemic? Actually, the biggest announcement and one of the most surprising announcements that I was made aware of early on, this is like back in, back in April, um, the databases that we have in our library's collection that would be helpful to genealogical researchers are accessible by you and me who are our Schomburg card holders. You go to our website, you go to our list of databases, you can go to my web, my sub website, which is for genealogy, and look to see the various databases that exist. Um, for the most part, most of the databases are accessible to home users who would enter in their Schomburg Township District Library, library card number into the database, as well as their PIN number. PIN number is basically based on their birth birth month and birth year, and you could always get that set or change it to how you want to do that. But what we found out early on in April was is that Ancestry, who you see the commercials on TV for left and right, for research, for DNA, that they were one of the first realizing what the pandemic was going to do because libraries were closing. And Ancestry Library Edition was one of those databases that at the time of the pandemic, although not available to home users, it was available to those who came to the library. So Ancestry, I will give all the credit in the world, they realized that for them it was a kind gesture 
for them to make the Ancestry Library Edition database available to home users who were Schomburg card holders. And if, by the way, if anybody who's participating in this, this uh, webinar, if you are not a Schomburg card holder, all is not lost. Almost every library that's in our Northwest suburban area, they, they almost all have Ancestry Library Edition. You just need to work with your own library to get access to Ancestry Library Edition to you through home, but through, the, but through your home library. So that has been a godsend to be able to do that. And the one thing that has been happening too, which has been a very nice extension is, as the pandemic keeps being lengthened out here, um, Ancestry has actually extended month by month by month and we are now um, with the database for Ancestry Library Edition. It can be accessed to home users of our Schomburg Library all the way now through the end of August. So I'm hoping that that continues past that into September. Right. And you can find all that in our e-library, correct? Correct. Or another thing you could find genealogy-wise, uh, Veterans History Project-wise, if you go to our main library website, and at the top, click on the tab that says services. It'll open up to a list of services, one of them being genealogy. If you click on that link, it will take you to the homepage that I have as part of the library, but it's dedicated to genealogy. And you will then find links to me. It'll, you'll be able to contact me directly. Uh, you'll find links to the blog that I author for the Library for Genealogy. You'll find links to the Veterans History Project, and it will give you links within that to get to the Veterans History Project interviews. So that's another sort of way, roundabout way to get to it, but it's more a direct route through me as the genealogy coordinator of the library. So we would love to hear from our audience uh, out at home or wherever you're watching. So please feel free to text your questions over by hitting the Q&A button. We'd love to get to your questions. We definitely want to hear from you and what's on your mind. Also, one other thing that I'm wondering about, uh, is there some special database that we that's available for veterans particularly of world war ii well actually one of the most recent genealogical uh webinars that i had online um, i focused on one one database among tens of thousands within ancestry library edition and it was a database that was basically called the world war ii young men's draft records 1942 to 1947. So that is because Ancestry Library Edition is available to our home users, but it's also, and again, some of the participants of the call may be subscribers to Ancestry Library Edition at a personal level. That's fine. The database is there. For those of you who are not subscribed, this is where access to Ancestry Library Edition to home users is invaluable. But one of the databases on that has been um, these draft records of World War II, not necessarily that they were veterans yet, but they just like, I went through the same thing when I was a lot younger. I had to register for the draft and I was uh, pretty close to getting involved in the Vietnam draft at that time where I was gonna be selected. Um, so, so it was the same thing to our ancestors back in the 1940s with World War II going on. So why this database was so wonderful is that it's literally universal to anybody who has ancestors across any part of the country. All the states are covered. Um, me personally, my ancestors, we always lived in the city of Chicago. So I could take my last name, search the database, and I think if I'm maybe not mistaken, I get maybe about 17 hits of ancestors of mine who were obviously in their 20s at the time in the 1940s who had to register for the draft. And I will say this, Renee, the images of this database are nothing short of spectacular. 
The size of the image is wonderful to read. The, uh, the, the apparently our ancestors were required by the government at the time to print their information on the card. And one of the things that's often the hardest thing for researchers to do is when you have to deal with handwritten records that are illegible. So you never know for sure if it's your ancestor, the way it was spelled. But looking at these, as long as you can input your last name, and now again, there could still be ways that these records when they were transcribed, still things could have been misdone and you're not able to find who you're looking for. Uh, there's ways to work around it. You don't do an exact name search, you do a near name search and you get more things to look through, but you can narrow down by doing that. But the, but the images are spectacular. And where else can you find images of your ancestors, little tidbits of life, like where was he living? Who should be contacted in case of an emergency? Where were they working? What was their phone number? Um, where, and even better, it gets better yet. That's, there's two sides of the card. One is the sort of the general information that the veteran filled in with the basic information. But everybody who accesses this database, you need to look at both sides of the card because the second side tells you all the physical attributes of your ancestor. Where else would you like to find out how tall they were? What was sort of their complexion? Um, how, how much did they weigh? And Renee, the funny part was, is even when I was looking at my Kerna ancestors and looking to see who was there and what was there, and some of them I still wasn't quite sure who they were, but I, I think I got it narrowed down. But I would go card by card, front side, back side. I will tell you, and I mean, I don't know how I should take this or not, but more than half of my ancestors that were in this database, when they were looking at, I was physical attributes. Boy, I told, I was telling you, I found one card would say, oh, this veteran says he's got a tattoo. Another veteran, Karen ancestor, he's got a tattoo. Another one, another tattoo. Another one's got a scar above his eye. Another one's got a scar on his arm. I found so many physical things that were descriptive of my ancestors. No other place would I have ever found that because mainly you're putting down your name and address and information like that. You generally don't describe your physical attributes. So anybody who searches this database for their ancestors could be in for an incredible series of discoveries on all things related to them in the 1940s. Right, and we're going to ask you for the uh, actual name of that database or how to get there in one moment. But right now we have a question, uh, and then we'll go back a little bit to where we can find that database, just to be clear. So we have a question from Teresa who says, how would a newbie, so to speak, start his or her search? Uh, we know we start with a story, but can you elaborate on the beginning process and what information that you would ask those family members? Sure. The beginning process is simple. And it's first thing is don't do any searching right away for anything. Talk to whoever is still alive in your family in some way, shape, or form. Cousins that you know of older brothers, if you have an older brother that's 10 years older than you, they know so much more about family issues that you would never know about because you were way too young at that time. Capture what you can through these ancestors or through your, through your siblings, aunts, uncles, whoever is alive yet today. That's where you got to start. And again, what you want to capture is first with their permission. The best thing is if you're going to interview somebody like we're being interviewed now, and if you're going to interview some cousin, ask for permission if you can do it where you can record it video, audio wise, however you can do that. Because one of the things that I've learned is when a relative is describing something about it and you're new to it, you, you don't know right or wrong, fact or fiction, close or far in terms of how it is to reality. So 
what these recorded interviews will serve you will be more for the future. As your research progresses, you always can go back to these interviews. And if your cousin said something about a location where they thought a family was growing up at some point, that's where, aha, uh -huh, now I can go back because I'm further along in my research. I can find out, did that family side live in Indiana because I'm going to be progressing? When you really start doing your actual research, the records that I suggest most to do first are going to be the United States Census records. And why I say that is because they are available right now to the public going backwards in time, starting with 1940. And in the federal census required by our constitution, it's done every 10 years. And coincidentally, we in this year 2020 just did a census. So the ones that are available to the public are 1940, 1920, going back. The most valuable ones are starting really about 1880 through 1940. And I say that because every census year, the questions were different. The relationships that were shown on these ledger sheets were different. Before 1880, sometimes you saw a list of names on a census record and you thought, oh, these are all the children of this head of the household and the wife. Not necessarily because as their brothers and sisters were dying, Oftentimes, they absorbed those children of those families into the census when it was done. And so, therefore, as a researcher, yeah, there's a name under what looks to be a mother and a father. But unless you know what the relationship is to everybody in that family unit, you can't assume that. And it was in 1880 when these relationships were being started to be shown. So the census going back, you start with you first. If you can go back to 1940 in a census, amen, that's good. But if you can't, you're going to start connecting who your parents were, who your grandparents were, and get them, get somebody, some family unit going back to that 1940 census and keep working back. Do not skip any steps. I've had people come to me they knock on my door at work and they say something like, I'm going on a vacation to Ireland. Story is it that we've got Irish ancestors. I'm going to Limerick. What can you do to help me find my ancestors? And oftentimes you can't really do much because you got to build all the connecting bridges from you to your parents, to your grandparents, and start connecting everything mm -hmm. where records are proving things out. So do we have other questions from our viewers? We would love to answer your questions, uh, give you a second or two to type the questions that you may have. And that's when I'll ask you, Tony, can you repeat where that World War II database is with the draft cards and all of that? Right. Normally the way people research using Ancestry, they can go right at the very part at the beginning and there's boxes there to enter in the surnames that they're interested in. That's an easy way to do it. And I do want to make sure that if they did their surname in those search boxes, and you can do it two ways, put it in and type the, hit the X box to say exactly the way that it's spelled or leave it unboxed and let it do it. So you, as a researcher, you're going to wind up doing it multiple ways anyhow. But if you want to try and take the easy way and hope and assume that your ancestors are in these databases the way that you know their spelling, start that way. It's easy. You will actually get results back in terms of records, numbers of records among all kinds of databases. Ancestry Library Edition has a category grouping. If you look at the results, upper right hand corner, you can click on the link that's going to say categories. And one of the categories is going to be military. You can open up that series of databases and you may very well see very easily on that there should be a database in the results that should say something. And again, I'm not quite exactly, exactly uh, accurate on this, but it's going to be 
World War II young men or draft cards, young men, comma, 1942-1947. And so you'll know you're in that right database. Uh, but I think too, if you're gonna be doing just a general search in Ancestry, here's your opportunity to browse around and see the various databases that your ancestors are showing up in. Um, it, it can be pretty eye-opening. And this is where you're gonna, again, the most current closer to you is where you start building those bridges in terms of your, in terms of the dates and the times of the records when they're included in there. Sounds like really good advice, particularly to delve into this before you go overseas. So I could imagine that it would take months of research before you are about to leave on your trip, that you're, put, you're connecting all the dots. So do we have any more questions from our viewers? Tony would be happy to answer them. And are they able to contact you from your genealogy page as well, right? Yes, there is a contact uh, link over there that will automatically send what you write in that contact list. It forwards it through to my, uh, to my work email address. And again, my, I can save my work email address right now. It's a very simple, short one. It's spelled, again, my last name is Karina, but my email address through work is A K I. E R N A at S T D L dot org O R G. We're still open for any questions. Otherwise, we invite you to go to the genealogy page, our e library, and do all those things that you can uh, do on our website. So, and I, I would like to add too that. Um, for those of you who are beginning your, your research new, um, through our library, we are now, we have been for quite a while, we've been offering monthly genealogy programs, but obviously with the pandemic and the closing of the library, those had to come to a halt. We restarted doing the programs in June, and obviously, like what we're doing with me right now, we are using the platform of Zoom to conduct our genealogy programs. Um, I've actually added an additional genealogy program per month. We do our programs where we have a speaker giving a topic on a, on a variety of, or giving his particular program on a topic. We try to have those on the second Tuesday evening of every month. Next one coming up is the August 11th program. Uh, topic is gonna be about what were the occupations and jobs of our ancestors. And Ginger Farrar is gonna be our speaker. And she was previously associated with the Newberry Library downtown Chicago. And so she's gonna do that. You can find that program in our library's calendar of events for August 11th, just like you selected this one to register for. You will need to register for it. We send out the Zoom Connect link via the registration information that you give us. So that'll be coming up next week, Tuesday evening. And the other thing that I started, which was, I thought pretty good, and it was sort of to get us all together again uh, those of us who had been participating with me in our programs previously, I do a, what, what I call a genealogy chit chat program. We do this one on the fourth Tuesday, but we do this one in the afternoon. We do it from two o'clock to 3.30 and I'll bring a topic to the program to talk about. But the goal of these programs is where it allows, and I do limit, I limit it to no more than 20 participants. And we do it as a Zoom meeting. So you can be on video if you want, you can have your audio on, everybody can be interacting. And I'll bring the topic to bear, talk about it a little bit, and what questions that we have among the participants, questions that they brought to the program, we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. And um, I mean, we sort of have a pretty good time. It's an informal thing and it's a more like a, uh, it's not like 40 or 50 or 60 people participating like a, like a program where you can't all interact. So again, that's the fourth Tuesday. I think the next one we've got is August 25th. Um, programs for us, 
going out into the future, it's still an uncertain world with the pandemic. So we've got pretty much our genealogy programs scheduled, although they're available in our calendar for the August and September programs. So second, fourth Tuesday in each of those months, you should be able to find our programs if you're interested in participating in. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing all this information, not only with our library patrons, but with staff, because it really helps us reach those veterans. And I so appreciate you coming with me over to Friendship Village and so forth in order to, to do this and to capture these histories. So we have a thank you message and um, we have a comment here from Eric who says, Tony may want to mention to others uh, the benefit of Schomburg being a family search affiliate oh, yes. if you have not already. I so have not because, because we, on that. we didn't talk about that before. What Eric is referring to, thank you, Eric, for bringing that up. Um, in the world of of you got Ancestry Library Edition or a subscription to Ancestry, but on the converse, there's also through the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they are very popular with having their own website called familysearch.org. And you can search those databases if you went to their website, just like you would search on Ancestry Library Edition. Same thing, you can search them to try and find your ancestors. The reason being is they have their own versions of databases. Some may be very similar or the exact ones that Ancestry has, but Ancestry has databases that Family Search does not have and vice versa. So that keep that in mind. You will never be completely successful in doing your research if you only stick to one main provider of databases you have to branch out to wherever that you can get to access these uh, databases. But specifically what Eric is mentioning about a, a family affiliate, um, whoever's old enough, I'm old enough, I can tell you this, we used to do research using microfilms and you had to go to what's called the Family History Library right down the road from us. It's part of the Mormon church that's located on Schomburg Road in between Braintree and Springensgooth. Um, microfilms were the big thing, but in our digitized world today, the Mormon church through family search has been digitizing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the databases that they have that were originally on microfilm. Um, what us being an affiliate does, it's it's really an amazing thing, but you almost have to know in advance something when you search for your, I don't, and you're not searching for your ancestors, you're searching the family search online catalog to look for a locality. Say you wanted to find out what records the uh, family history library in Salt Lake has for the state of Nebraska. You can do that. It will give you the ability to click your way through and it will give you a list of here are the records that are existing and most of them should probably be in digital format. You would click on that and it ultimately will give you an icon identification of can that film be viewed online? Yes, that's great if you can do it. Um, but the affiliate status gives us as the library the ability for the user to access even more visuals of more of these microfilms that have been converted into digital format. And I give you, I'll give a very simple example. If I do my Polish research and I know a particular town in Poland that I'm interested in and I'm home, if I'm home and I'm looking at that particular village, it may tell me, well, there's 25 equivalent films for this village broken out into various categories of births, marriages, deaths, but they identify these films with a little icon. 
If you see an icon that's a pure camera icon, I can view that at home. So at home, when I'm looking at these, these village films, there's four, five, six, whatever the number is, that have a camera icon with a key above it. And if I try to access that from home, I can't. A message comes up and says, in order to view this microfilm digitally online, you have to view it either through a family history center, which is part of the Mormon church where they have a little room where you can do research, or a family history library affiliate like us. So as another, using that same example, there are five or six films that are not available for me to view from home. But here's a little bit of a catch. In order to get the benefit of the affiliate status of us, you either have to be in our library using our computers connected to Family Search using your Family Search username and password, or your laptop connected to our Wi Fi, or if this is the Eric that I know who's the Eric, I think, it could very well be that you can actually be outside of our physical building and our Wi-Fi signal goes out there and you can be in our parking lot and connect to our library that way. And the suggestion is you wanna be on the west side of our building. And I've had people, if this is the Eric I know, and there's many, many others, who during the pandemic, when the library was closed, they could actually come to the library parking lot, park out there, connect to our Wi-Fi signal, and continue to do research with family search through us as an affiliate. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that there's more available, but you have to do this in our library or connect it to our Wi-Fi, whether you're in our library or outside in a parking lot. Well, thank you for that tip. Uh, we also have a question from Sam uh, in a comment. Thank you, Tony, for all the work that you do. Your passion for your job is evident. Agree. Um, by the way, uh, did I hear that you uh, were um, awarded Librarian of the Year due to the Veteran History Project? I, I did receive an award. I don't, it, I don't think it was anything one thing it was related to. I will you know, I was honored to receive it. It was by the Illinois Library Association a couple years ago. Uh, and thank you again through my manager and the library all the way up to our director. Um, they submitted my name to the Illinois Library Association for consideration. And yes, I was magically uh, selected for it. I wound up going to Peoria for the award and uh, and I mean, it, it's, it's, more, it's more than just that, the, the uh, um, Veterans History Project. I think it was so much more that we were doing with the programs, with the help that I can offer to people. Uh, and, and, and as crazy as this sounds, is even in a Zoom world, as we're living in now in a pandemic, me being able to add on now a second genealogy program that allows us to really talk things through has been wonderful. But... Whoever is asking that question, thank you for asking it. Uh, you know, I, I just do a good job as best as I can. And, you know, sometimes rewards come where they are. Okay. Well, as we conclude, um, Darlene says, congratulations, Tony. Well deserved. And I have to agree. As I've said, Tony's a fabulous networker across the library. And it's been wonderful to partner with you and get the word out. So if you know anyone who should be telling their veterans uh, their history as a veteran, be sure to contact Tony. I, I will say yeah. uh, one thing, Renee, exactly, and that is related to the veterans thing, as you can be aware of now. We, because the pandemic has shut us down in such a way and, re and reduced our ability to do the things we did, if anyone knows of a veteran, who would be interested in me doing an interview, please capture their name, contact information, share it with me because we have not been able to do the veteran history interviews because we can't go any place to be with, with the veterans. We can't go to Friendship Village. Um, there's so many more limitations, but at least I would like to build up a new list of potential interviews that I could conduct in the near term future. Right, and there's always Zoom. 
There is Zoom, yes. Yeah. So thank you again for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the offer to participate, Renee.